Okay, so, so this is chapter one. And basically, you know, this is a review of basic statistical concepts. So, you know, as I was telling you, I start with the basic concept of statistics. Probably you're going to see, I introduce some new things here and there, but basically this should be like a, a review. So, you know, the first important uh, concept when we're talking about uh, statistics is the, the concept of population. You know, and the population are all the units of interest to researchers. Uh, for example, let's say that we're interested a population of interest are all Texas households. Okay, so of course you know that's the population, and most of the time the, our population of interest are very large. Okay, so it's almost impossible to reach each of those units in our population of interest. So usually what we do is we go and take a sample. Okay, so. A, sam a sample, of course, is going to be a subset or what? Population. Of the population. Okay. Once again, in the context of our example, then this should be just a subset of the Texas, of Texas households. So once again, example. Sample of Texas households. Okay, so, and there, here is where statistics come in. Basically, because everything that we do in statistics, more or less, has to do with something related to the estimation, the prediction about the population by using just information that we get from the sample. And that's it. I mean, that's pretty much everything, or most, okay, I'm not gonna say everything, but most of what we do in statistics is to try to learn something about the population using the sample. So statistical inference basically involves is, is estimate prediction about the population based on sample information. Okay, so you know have, have that in mind. And you know, I'll go back to this concept again, this concept of population going from, from the sample. Okay, so now more specifically, you know, when we're doing a statistics, what we do is we use what are called variables. Okay, so we're not interested about everything in the population. You know, we're just interested in some specific characteristics of that population of interest. So actually, a variable is basically nothing else but a characteristic of the population of interest. So once again, thinking about my example. So you see, I'm an economist, so I might be interested in income, in the you know, income and the population of Texan households. Maybe those in nutritional science are interested about diet quality. Okay. Maybe if you are in business, you are interested about their purchasing power, you know, how much money they have to buy stuff. Okay, so yeah, so that's basically what we have. So these variables are characteristics of that population of interest. Now, you know, again, when we're doing analysis and statistics, you know, we kind of tend to classify to make our life easier. We tend to classify these variables in two types. One type of variables are going to be what we call quantitative variables, and other variables are what we call qualitative variables. So a quantitative variable is basically is going to be a, you know, a quantitative variable is going to be related to a characteristic that can be measured. I mean, basically. So a quantitative variable is related. To a characteristic that can be measured. So now, once again, if we were to use our examples, 
actually the, are those three examples correspond to you know, quantitative variables. Once again, income. And gain. Well, I mean, so that equality is tricky. As a matter of fact, that it can also be measured. Actually, I'm a nice expert on, on measuring that equality. So when we're talking about qualitative variables, basically those are, you know, so those are variables related to characteristics of, of the population that can be used, that can only be used to classify the population in one or several groups. So basically, again, qualitative variables, what you have to be thinking is about classification of that population in several groups. So again, if we go back to our example, and I'm going to write that in a second. Well, let me, let me write that down first. Okay, and then we'll talk about the example. So again, these are going to be related to a characteristic that can only be used to classify the population in one or several groups. Now, this can be a little bit tricky, but just let's go with the basic. So for example, so what we can have here, you know, a way to classify the population, it would be the, the, you know, the gender of the head of the household. It can be a male or a female. So maybe the gender of the head of the household. So the other one, it could be location. And you know, here I'm talking about maybe urban or rural area. Okay, so remember, we're talking about this, you know, the example of my population of interest are all Texas uh, households. So here again, it could be the location. So you can classify households that are being located in the urban area or the rural area. This is location, urban. Okay, so that's kind of the basic. Now, I need to mention, and don't, don't think too much about this thing, but just to, to clarify things. So sometimes, you know, you can use the quantitative information to create qualitative variables, okay? but you can never go the, the other way around. So for example, with income, you know, you can use some sort of poverty line, and then you can have low income, mid, you know, Low income, medium income, and high income individuals. Okay, so it's possible, again, to go from these quantitative characteristics to qualitative characteristics and then classify the individuals and groups. Or again, with high quality, I think that, you know, there are also some thresholds when you can say that's a, and Anna, I don't remember, what are they? So poor quality needs improvement and, uh, and good quality diet. Okay, so you see how you can go from one to the other. And once you have that, those are three groups where you can classify the population. Okay, so sometimes don't think that it's, you either have one bar or the other. I mean, sometimes, you know, or even, you know, if you think about something like education. So education could be people with college degree and without college degree. And then... You know, so that's, you see, that's a qualitative variable. The quantitative version of that might be the number of years of education. Okay, so sometimes, you know, you can have quantitative variables and use those to create like a qualitative variable. But more or less, I think that that's a good way to think about variables, especially later on when we're gonna be doing modeling. So, you know, quantitative variables, uh, you know, the qualitative variables are what we refer to as dummy variables or discrete variables, you know, they are very useful for modeling and doing regression and doing analysis. Okay, so that's where this thing is gonna fit in later on. Okay, so now, you know, describing quantitative variables. Uh, so once again here, you know, 
when, when we're talking about the description of these quantitative variables, what I, once again, what I want you to have in mind is what is the sample and what's the population. Because remember, most of the time in statistics, what we do is we try to learn something about the population using information from the sample. Okay, so let's start with the basic uh, measures to describe quantitative variables. So the, the, the first one, uh, probably the most common one, are, are measures of central tendency. So, and, and, and among those, we have the sample mean. Um, you know, I'm not gonna be talking about that. We also have, do, do you remember what others are measures of central tendency? The medium. And also the mod. Okay, but the one that we usually use for our analysis is gonna be the sample mean. And you know, I'm gonna even write for you, and so let's say that the quantitative variable we're gonna be denoted, in our example, is gonna be denoted by x. Later on, I'll switch to y, but you should get used to having you know, random variables with any name. So the sample mean for this variable that I call x, Remember, it's the sum of all the values of x. So this is the sum from 1 to n divided by n. And I'm sure that you've seen this formula before. Everybody probably should have seen this formula before. Now, when we're talking about the population mean, we, use, we usually use what's the mu. Okay, so remember, we're interested in this mu. Now, sometimes to make our life even more difficult, we call it the expected value of x, okay? And you are gonna see this thing. So this is kind of like fancy statistical notation for the mean. So this is called expected. So these are expectations. But again, but don't get afraid of it because in terminology is the same as the mean. So this is called expected value. So and the expected value is the same as the mean and the population, okay? And later on, I'll go back to, to this thing. So remember, mu is equal to the expected value of x. It's the same thing. Now, measures of dispersion. Again, the most commonly used are going to be the sample variance. So the formula for the sample, does anybody remember the formula for the sample variance? Okay, is the sum, okay, I'm gonna give you a hint. No heavy, just thinking. The x1 minus x the mean. Square divided by n minus one. Okay, so you know, one way to think about it, and, and I know that you know some professors like to emphasize a lot of these things, like degrees of freedom. But the way to think about it, you take out, just don't think about the n minus one, think about the n. Basically what you we have here is an average of the square deviations from the mean. Okay, again, so just forget about the minus one for a second. So you see, the sample variance is just like the average of deviations from the mean. Average of the square deviations from the mean. I mean, that's that's basically what you are doing. And if you think about that, why do you use the square? Because those deviations can be to the left or to the right of the mean. So what you are doing is giving them both kind of the same way. So it doesn't matter if it's the left or to the right. So that's kind of what is measuring that dispersion. So you divide the deviations, you know, how far away is each value from the mean? And then you square them. And then you divide all of this by n minus one. And that's kind of some sort of average. Okay, so it's the average deviations Average square deviations from the mean. So that's, you know, an intuitive way to think about it. And again, this is an average square deviations from the mean. Yeah. So again, that's an intuitive way to think about. A lot of professors emphasize the same minus one, but the way I think about it, you know, once you have a thousand observations, I mean, if you divide by 999 or by a thousand, the difference are gonna be, is gonna be very small. 
So this n minus 1 comes in when you have like three or four or five observations. But even when you have 100 observations already, it doesn't matter if you have 100 or 99. The answer is going to be very similar. So that's again, so that's it's average deviations, average squared deviations from the mean. That's what you are using. So in terms of the population variance, usually we use sigma. Sigma square. Now, sometimes in a statistics, what we do is for the population, for example, we use sigma square. And then for the sample, we use the hat. And those that took my stats class remember the hat. I use a hat for everything. So basically, the hat denotes sample. Sometimes, you know, we could call this one. Sometimes you're going to see some textbooks. Instead of calling them x bar, you can call it u hat x. You know? And I think that's the mean. So the same thing here. Population variance. And again, I was telling you, <clears throat> do you remember we said that expectations are the averages? Well, I mean, another way to write the population variance is, again, is as the average of the differences is square. So you see, it's the average value of the square differences. So it's kind of the same thing. And of course, the sample standard deviation. Now this, you should remember. What's the standard deviation? It's just the square root of the variance. You just we take the square roots of these things. So for the sample variance, so that sample standard deviation, this is going to be the square root of a square, or the square root of sigma square hat, and the population standard deviation is just the square root of the population variance. Okay. Okay, so again, so remember, big picture here, you know, what we're trying to, to, to do is kind of describe these quantitative variables. So we have some measure of central tendency, measures of dispersion, uh, sample standard deviation. And sometimes what we use to describe the variable is we use a histogram. Okay, another way to describe the data. So in the histogram, what we have, and we're using x here. So remember, what we do is we pick ranges of values of x. So for example, I'm going to be using from 0 to 10, from 10 to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And do you remember what we, do we have in the y-axis? In the histogram? This is the relative frequency, OK? So it's the relative, or the percentage. So it's relative to everything that you have. And what's the percentage? This is the percentage, or this is the relative frequency. OK, so and then usually what we do is we, have, we come up with a graph that is going to look like that. So in essence, what the histogram give us, you know, when we look at each of these bars, what we have is the percentage of observations within certain ranges of x. So what we have is the percentage of observations within certain ranges of x. OK, so that's basically what we have in the histogram. So you see here, and, and I, so of course, you know, the maximum, the relative frequency is going to be like a 90. So let's say that this is just, I don't know, let's say this is 5. And things should add up to 100. So this might not add to 100, just as an example. Basically, we're saying that 5% of the observations are between 0 and 10, OK, and so on and so forth. So that's basically what we have in the history. 
Okay, but remember, so this is what we get from the sample. But now we have this population. So what's a probability distribution? That's something that's a little bit more complicated. So what's a probability distribution? That's a tougher question. And probably you've never thought about it. But one way to think about it, the probability distribution, okay, this is the population counterpart of our sample. In the sample, we get a histogram. In the population, we have what's called a probability distribution. So that's a, pro that's a population concept. And this is a bit tricky. OK, I'm going to give it to you. So but basically, the probability distribution is what's called it's a mathematical model. And when we talk about a mathematical model, that's a function that contains information about the relative frequency of the variable, but in the population. of the relative frequency of the variable in the population. OK? So this is a mathematical model or a function that contains information about the relative frequency of the variable in the population. So remember, once again, in the sample, the histogram gave us information about the relative frequency. When we have this probability distribution, this model also is going to contain this information about the relative frequency. So for example, and you know, and when you are doing research or you are reading papers, so what's the most commonly assumed probability distribution? You should know this one. The normal. Everybody talks about the normal distribution. So you see, that's kind of like a mathematical model. And this mathematical model, once again, is going to contain information. And you see this mathematical model. I mean, that's going to be very smooth. You see, in the histogram, we have these steps. Here, in the normal distribution, on the other hand, you know, it's going to look, everything looks kind of, and it's smooth. And actually, this is also relative. If you think about that, so we, we don't call it relative frequency. We call it f of, you know, it's a function. So we call it f of x. I mean, that's what's called probability density function. And this is x. But again, if you remember from your basic stats class, if we go and measure the area, and this is the curve, this area also contains information about the relative frequency. It gives you the probability, which is a relative frequency. So this area so the relative frequency is the area under the curve. OK, so it's the same thing. But once again, this is the population. This is kind of like a theoretical thing. And this is what you get from the sample. OK? OK, so now let's talk a little bit more about this specific you know, uh, probability density function, the normal distribution, since the most commonly used. Um, so let's talk about that one, some more details. So once again, the normal probability distribution is, as I was telling you, is a theoretical model for the relative frequency of a variable in the population.
of a variable in the population. Now, I told you that you, know, you could use a mathematical model, so I'm going to give you the formula. So and I'm using x. OK, so I'll use x. And this thing looks complicated. Oh, this thing jumped. Sorry. E. So remember, E is a constant. Uh, it's 2.7. Does anybody have a calculator? So what's e is e to the minus one half y minus mu square. So you have e x to the one. See, in the in the in the calculator, sometimes they call it x. So, so what's the number, Uncle? Ah, seven one. Seven one eight? Seven one eight. Okay. Okay, so in the calculators you will see it's it's a constant, it's like pi. So it's the same thing. You know, it's one of those numbers that magic numbers in mathematics that show up. So that's one of those. And that's what you know we have it like in the in the calculator. They call it exp. So but this is the formula. Again, I mean it looks kind of complicated. But again, you know, a mathematical function, what we do is we just go, and I have y there. Sorry. This is supposed to be a function of x. So this should be x here. Okay. And but, but let me let me define something. So that's mu. So that's what E is, is a constant. Before I talk the formula. Mu and sigma are parameters. So those are values, too, that are going to be fixed. So for example, for the standard normal, you remember, mu equal to 0, and sigma equal to 1 for what's called the standard normal distribution. So the point is that these specific values are going to be fixed for, you know, for the distribution of a variable. So I was telling you, just don't get too scared. This is just a function. You see, what you do is you go and plug in a specific value of x. And if you have it like an Excel, actually it's easier in Excel, or now, I mean, with modern calculators, you change the value of x, and that is going to give you a value for f of x, which is kind of what we get in the graph that we had above. You see? We pick a specific value of x, and we're going to get the value for fx. So here, you know, it, let's say that this we call this xj. So this is going to give us the value for f xj. It's a function. So you know, if we pick enough values of xj, we will be able to graph this this curve. So it's a mathematical model that we believe is in the population. Um, so so let me see. So you know, usually mu, remember, that parameter is the mean of the distribution. Uh, sigma is the standard deviation. of the normal distribution. So uh, you see, actually, you see the normal distribution. In the normal distribution, the mu and the standard deviation are parameters of the model. I mean, that's not the case for every distribution. For some other distributions, that might not be the case. So you know, it's kind of very beautiful distribution. It's a very nice model, because actually the mean and the standard deviation of this distribution are actually parameters that you can see. Here. So, you know, if we were to graph in terms of that mu and sigma, so remember that this is f of x, this is x, 
So remember, this would be mu here. And then, of course, so that's what they call it sometimes the location parameter. You see, if the mu changes, this distribution is, is going gonna, is gonna to change of location to the left or to the right. Okay, so that's what defines that. And this sigma, on the other hand, so what, what is that is going to be affecting? See. Exactly, it's the dispersion. Okay, so if it's larger, you're going to see like more dispersion. If uh, sigma is smaller, it's going to be more concentrated. Okay, so mu. So that's what called the location. And what we call the dispersion is defined by by sigma. Okay, so that's a normal distribution. So some other things about the standard normal distribution. Uh, then of course, it's symmetric about the mean. And I was telling you that the spread of that dispersion is determined by sigma. Okay. And of course, I mean, you all know that's a bell-shaped distribution. Okay. Again, this is a mathematical model. It's, it's kind of very, it's, it's central to a lot of things that we do in statistics. Probably we have the last two things. So why is this normal distribution so important? Because you see, many empirical distributions are actually approximately normal. Like for example, I think that you know people have seen to the height of people, and overall, you know, you see that that has like a normal distribution, or maybe you know like the weight of animals, that also tends to be pretty normal. So actually, some empirical distributions for some real data, I mean, you have. That, that show up in, in, in nature. I mean, that's what is kind of beautiful. You go and take data, you know, from, from nature, and this empirical, yeah, and this, this distribution shows up. So many empirical distributions are approximately normal. And also theoretically, you know, some theoretical results, and we're gonna be talking about the specific, uh, specific results, which is called the central limit theorem, which is actually, you know, when, Mathematicians or statisticians do these you know, derivations. You know, they are deriving some things, and the, this you know, normal distribution shows up as part of the results. So also theoretically, uh, a number of tests and results rely on the normality assumption. So that's what's important you know, to have it in mind. Okay, but you know, don't be too intimidated. I know that it looks kind of like a formula. For some of you, it might look easy. For some of you, it might look complicated. But at the end of the day, this is just it's like a function. It's like a formula that has a defined set of parameters and that you actually graph it if you change the different values of x. Okay, so I think that this is a, you know, I know that I still have one minute, but it's a good place to, to stop. Because uh, the next class, what we're going to be talking about is, you know, what are called sampling distributions and the central limit theorem, which actually is related to this normal distribution. It's also is going to be related to some, uh, actually, going to be related to all of those uh, statistics that we talk about, the mean, the standard deviation, the variance. So this result is going to be related to those two topics that we already talked about today. Okay, guys, do you have any question? Everything is clear? Okay, so I'll send you an email to remind you about doing, you know, like kind of the online introduction. It's kind of very short, like we did today. Maybe I'll add like one, two questions. Um, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Okay. Have a good day.